I'm Mark Lander, another one of the weird guys. I work with Gary, Dr. K, you may even may have seen him last night. Uh, Dr. Galabi, he's here tonight. He works in a different unit, but he's uh, also here. He's, uh, he's, not he's going to talk to you. Uh, I'm a weather guy. Gary does the uh, biology and the chemistry stuff, and I'm right next door. I'm the climate, weather, uh, global warming, typhoon, you name it. Um, I'm in an interesting business now because the climate stuff has become so political. So I do a lot of work on climate. My, my most expertise is right in tropical, tropical cyclones, typhoons, typhoon studies. That's why I came here. Uh, I was in the Navy in 1979. I came out to be at the typhoon center because of the typhoons. Uh, they wanted to send me to Monterey, and I couldn't imagine why I wanted to go to Guam, but they said, I'm sorry, okay, we'll send you to Guam. Came out to see the typhoons, and I did. This is from my office. Uh, back in, before, when we were having typhoons. How many people here have noticed we really haven't had any for a long, long, long time? Uh, how many people <coughs> have heard that we're supposed to get more typhoons than one more hurricane? More hurricanes, more typhoons, more tropical cyclones. Anyone hear that? And four. Anyone here that's supposed to be the world? Nobody ever hear that? Dread. <laughs> well, that's what the models have been showing. But anyway, I'll get to it. But back in the day, this is 2002. It was one of the how long? The how long in 2002? The name came around again or twice. Well, so I'm looking out my office at Pablo Bay. I'm being circled. Okay. The talk, I give, I give climate talks everywhere. So I got hundreds of them. I got more PowerPoints about climate than anything, so I, kinda, I got three up there already. So many people watching me, I don't have a watch at work tonight. Six watches, you know, and you know, and you know, smash and go. But anyway, so give me a sign for the time. Or I'll talk longer than Gary. Um, what's happening now in climate, it's beyond sort of the study of climate. Um, even our research agencies are, gi are giving grants now. We are supposed to provide scenarios of future climate. Not just talk about the climate, talk about the past climate, talk about global warming, talk about climate mechanisms, talk about what we might see happening with typhoons or whatever. I've been in a lot of tropical cycle meetings where that, that's a major focus. What's going to happen to tropical cycles in a warmer world? And then we pass it around and think about things. We've taken the next step, I think a little bit prematurely, but that's where they want us to go. I put my email today, I think NOAA provides toolkit for decision makers on, uh, I it there, some anticipating or, or planning for or taking action, <coughs> action on, it goes on and on, all this weird uh, sort of bureaucratic mumbo jumbo about taking action and plans and doing things based on climate projections. So, well, that's why the, the 100 year plan. What are we going to do? What are you, you know, how are you going to, you know, building codes and whatnot? But um, anyway. Um, and since I'm in climate too, everywhere I go, as soon as people know that I'm a climate or weather guy, the first question almost, everyone just kind of looks at me. First, if they understand what a meteorologist or a climatology is, but sometimes they think it's astrology. But I'll get the elbow. So, uh, do you believe in global warming? I'm like, um, I, I, I got to the point where I don't answer these questions directly anymore. I don't say yes, no, indifferent. Or they might say, um, the next question would be, so are we doing it? And then, what do I need to do? do I, should I drive a Prius? What you know, what's my role? And I just, I used to kind of get into it, and then you end up getting just in arguments with people. Um, so what I just do now is I just say, well, like my bride went back to Rhode Island last year. I just show them the data. Uh, there's another site for me. Uh, this one, uh, was back in Boston about four months ago, back in June, maybe it's, I don't know, kind of months before now, yeah, but. Um, I did this. I went to Boston, so I just picked up Newport. I, what I know is the data. I'm a data specialist. I got I even have my own rainfall data sets out here. I get 15 years of one minute rainfall from Rhode Island on plus a rainfall data, Guam typhoon records, data, just more data than you ever would know that that, that anyone ever looks at. So I got the sea level in Newport, Rhode Island, and all kinds of things. Here's Guam sea level. Here's just an interesting point: global warming, climate change. All right, the temperatures are rising. Big deal. So what? Gets a little warmer, gets a little cooler. Well, all this other stuff's tight. Sea level rising. Maybe typhoons get more, get less, get more intense typhoons. You've heard it all. What did I read? Everybody is in on this. It's a, it's a game. Uh, the latest was it's going to be more lightning in a wall of wood. I mean, I, every day I see something new. Every day it's a new thing. Uh, a new 
bad thing. It's not usually a good thing. It, that's why nobody ever heard about there's going to be fewer tropical cyclones in the long run. Well, that might be a good thing. You never hear the good things. Um, I see them and hear them, but I ask people, they don't know about it. They don't see it. Sea level is one thing. It's, it's obviously sea level rise is a bad thing if it happens too quickly. Uh, and there's a data. And this is usually what most people are worried about. They don't care if the temperature here gets warmer or cooler by a degree or two. Um, they do care a little bit if the typhoons get more or less, but obviously people perceive, they know from their own experience that we're not getting as many typhoons. In the 90s, we had a lot of typhoons, and now we're not getting any. So that kind of went off the radar. Not in the Atlantic, since they had, were so busy there, but here the typhoons are mostly sea level. And there it is, Guam sea level. Interesting about Micronesia, you only really need one tide gauge of Micronesia. Every island does the same thing. And the big ups and downs there are ENSA. El Nino governs the sea level here. To the degree, the same as the tide, two feet. The tide is about two feet. The El Nino to La Nina is two feet. It's huge. And here's a real interesting thing. Guam sea level, Micronesia sea level, all the way through here. When Al Gore went to Kyoto in 1997, up there to sign the Kyoto Protocols, which they did. The executive branch signed it. This is another thing people don't understand. How many people think that the United States did not sign or participate in Kyoto because George Bush didn't sign it? How many think? Nobody even cares. How many people realize that the Clinton administration actually signed it? They signed the Kyoto Protocols. You know that. Why isn't the United States in the Kyoto Protocols? Who refused to ratify it? The Senate, not Congress, specifically the Senate has to ratify it. When Clinton, when Al Gore went to, I'm getting off the track already, when Clinton went to Kyoto, about two months before, the Senate passed a resolution 95 to nothing, 95 to nothing, that they would not sign a climate treaty that A, B, C, D, they would, they would, would harm the U.S. economy, not be participated in by Russia or China, and Clinton took that. It was a warning shot across the bow. Clinton never sent it to the Senate. He signed it, but he didn't send it there. Because he knew. Said 95 to nothing. He said, we're not going to sign it. That's not how the news came out. Well, what did Clinton actually say? How did he let him get into politics? All right. See what happens with climate? What Clinton actually said is that, well, Alan Hyde, we tried so hard. We had, we had our hearts in that tree. We, we, had, we tried to hope that those Republicans in the Senate just blocked our every move. It was 95 to nothing. Anyway, that's the politics of this. I'm already into it. But anyway, when he went there, 97, it didn't have, from this part onward, it didn't have. The Pacific, Seal of the Pacific had a slight negative trend all through here. And they're all scratching their heads. Nobody knew why. Like, it's supposed to be rising, isn't it? So it was a little bit of a thorn in their side, like, well, the sea level's not rising here. But after the 97 El Nino, it rose. And then stayed up. 12 centimeters, those two pink bars, the 90s to the 2000s, is 12 centimeters in one decade. Anyone know the global warming rise? The supposed rise or the, the measured rise, the commonly cited rise of mean sea level around the globe. Anyone know any close to what it is? Per decade, what? Three centimeters. We went up 12 centimeters in one decade. What the heck? That. Anyway. And we're still up. Well, I didn't put the latest. Now we're in El Nino again, and we've come down a little bit. We're actually below normal sea level for the first time in a decade here, but an inch below normal. Because the El Nino has come back, but not way below normal like the other El Ninos. Anyway, it went up. And here's the run through. Micronesia, they all do the same thing. Kwajalein, Majuro, Pompeii, Yaf, Guam. Saipan doesn't have a reliable time gauge, much data, so on. But it doesn't matter. We all do the same thing. And the curious, here's the good part, this orange one, that's not sea level at all. That's the trade winds. It index of the trade winds out to our east. So what's causing our sea level changes here? The trade winds. Global warming? No. Trade winds. Oop. I'll get back to it. Here's another way of looking at it. Nobody ever understands this, but I just I sum up the anomalies as you go along. After the 97 El Nino, the trade winds and the sea level both took a jump up and stayed up. So the trade winds, to this day, are governing most of our sea level rise. It's been enormous. We lead the world in sea level rise here. 
And nobody really, really understands why. But um, And now we get this. I go to these climate workshops and everyone's telling me, we're going to get a meter of sea level rise by the year 2100. Three more feet by in 100 years. And I'm like, well, that's not my business. I tell people right up front, even when we are in the tropical cyclone one, we had the United Nations, the World Meteorological Organization, told our group, you guys tell us what hurricanes and typhoons are going to do in a warmer world. We started arguing about global warming, and argued and argued and argued about global warming. Finally, the guy stood up and said, wait a minute. So we're not the global warming guys. We're the typhoon guys. So I said, so what we need to do, let's just look. Those are, we, we reference the guys that do temperature. They're the warming guys. They get all the thermometers. They do the climate models. They do all the global warming stuff. We will say, according to them, the world will warm by X degrees in so many years, in different scenarios. Our, our task is to say, what will happen to typhoons if this happens? Okay, and then another guy said, but I don't believe it's warming. Shut up, Bill! We're not doing the warming. We're just going to say, what will happen? So in the typhoon business, that's what we did. We finally were able to get away from arguing about global warming to just talking about what might happen. And this gets interesting because this only started in 1993. It's the first time we ever sat down as a group to say, well, what might, what might happen to typhoons? More of them, more intense, longer season, make it further north. You know, five or six points. And I knew what was going to happen. As soon as we did that, that became not what we think might happen. It became what, what's going to happen. Right from the first meeting. That, we're going to get more typhoons, they're going to be more intense, they're going to have a longer season, they're going to make it further north, blah, 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 blah. It's like, man. So that's where that instantly got cemented in. Um, and then it came out a little later, not too, oh, 2006 was the first time the models indicated. It was a little bit quiet. We had the same meeting to update, and the mod, two models got up from England or somewhere, and they go, you know, um, our climate model works suggests there might be actually fewer tropical cycles in one world. <gasps> In fact, we didn't even say that. Say the guy from Hong Kong jumped up. He goes, "I refuse to tell people in Hong Kong that there'll be fewer tropical cyclones in Hong Kong. Can you tell me that there'll be fewer tropical cyclones in Hong Kong?" We go, "No, it's just a it's a global model. We're just counting cyclones at a crude way for them." Goes, well, that's then we don't. So that statement became there's some indication that maybe fewer tropical cyclones in the world. Comma. However, this result is uncertain at this time. The guy that was the global warming denier, you might call him, jumped up. He goes, what are we caveating this statement for? These results are all uncertain at this time. Anyway, so that's the politics of it. But the politics of it is probably nobody's heard that there might be fewer tropical cycles in a warmer world. And it, and it still continues. The models are getting better and better, and it's showing the same result. A net no change, or maybe a, even a 34% reduction. OK, there's the sea level. There's the meter rise, the pink dots, where we have to get to by the year 2100. It's a tall order. The green line is my fake data. I just faked in, every time I push my Excel chart, it updates and puts in an ENSO-like signal. The ENSO behavior is a strong part of the signal. Here's our big jump from the 90s to the 2000s, which has nothing to do with global warming. It has a little bit to do with the global It's part of the global rise. It's average in it. The three centimeter global rise includes our big rise, plus falls along the west coast. We're going to get from there to that pink dot. And I don't argue against it. So that's what they say. That's the model. And they even got it down to, they told me my curve was wrong. They said, no, the, the, we, I said, the, the, no, we, we put in, the, the curve accelerates in the early part and then goes on a steady rise thereafter. I'm going, wow. I said, really, why? Do you know it to that? Because, yeah, that's what the models are showing. That was old. So they, the models got it down to these fine levels of, this curve has to be a certain slope, and it accelerates between the year 2030 and 20 whatever, and then goes up. And so I don't, I don't even bother saying whether they're right or wrong. I just say, well, there's the data, there's the history, there's the why, and there's where they say we have to get to. I say, well, then there you go. It's kind of a tall order, not impossible, but considering the what it, what it literally means, we have to do the same thing every decade to, for the next eight decades that we just did. 10 centimeters a decade to rise a meter, right? We're going to do what we just did. And what we just did has nothing to do with global warming. So let's put that in. The, the current sea level rise is 3 centimeters. It's a global change now. That's got to accelerate. So now we're already 15 years into the century. So we've got to go more than 10 centimeters 
or at least start out going 3, 7, 9, 10. We're going to get to 12, 14, 15. We're going to really get going here pretty soon. But this is one that's so important, so dangerous to people, so worried. It's, I don't touch it. I say, that's, that's the prediction. Now they kind of lower it. They say two feet in 100 years. So they keep kind of fine-tuning it. But sea level rise is something most people are really upset about, really afraid, and would have an immediate severe consequence to like naturalism and that is. So this is an important one, but I'm a data person. I know the data, I know why the data did not most people don't know why the data does what it does. They just think that rise out here. It's either a mystery up through 97, or now it's who knows, that's a little warming to now, but um, I know exactly why it did what it did. Okay. Sea level, Newport, Rhode Island, of course Guam. Guam with this big argument over the years, what's causing all of this coastal erosion? Well, when has most of this, most of this occurred in the 1990s when we had a lot of typhoons? Typhoons are the specific cause of almost all coastal erosion. Big waves come in on typhoons. Not the sea level being high. In the last 10 years, with the sea level very high, we've had very little bit of coastal erosion because there's been no typhoons. So it's kind of coupled. You need the typhoons to do this, and without them, it happened in the 90s. Uh, washing out an iron tree that's probably 100 years old or whatever. Anyway, so that's a serious problem, but again, the cause and, and then how you plan for it. Um, this is a little TV lead to work. This is us in here, 10 centimeter over uh, whatever the time period is, very, very high, and falling on the west coast. So they average that all out, and you get 3 centimeters per decade for the globe. But we were leading the world. Now, who knows? Um, this is another thing I do. It took Providence, Rhode Island. All of the things we're going to we keep being told these things. Uh, this is what we've been told to plan for. And uh, uh, even the granting agencies now are telling us, we have to tell people out here, give them scenarios. We already have our uh, modelers, our, our groundwater modelers, are using the CMIP, the Climate Model Intercomparison Project, the CMIP climate models. They're downscaling. They're looking out to out years in 30-year blocks on What's your extremes? You're going to get higher peak rainfall. You're going to get more or less annual rainfall. They got all of these. The guy that was recently doing a, a groundwater model actually looked out into like the year 2050. And he took a handful, a, a dozen CMIP intercomparison models, and had gap getting anywhere from 2 to 5 meters of rainfall in, in a year. But, well, that's really useful. That, I mean, how are you going to downscale? I mean, 5 meters of rain, that's almost 200 inches of rain. Is that almost time? I can go on for five o'clock in the morning. Um, anyway, but this is one of the kind. I went to Boston, so I decided I'm going to look. This is a place. Here's Climate Central, MIT, Harvard, Tufts. It's the conference is at Tufts University. You know the true believers. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying these. I don't think these people ever take a step back and just think of the practical implications. If I'm saying we're going to get more, more extreme. How many of you said in a warmer world, even out here? Increased stormings. Anyone heard that term? Right, you've heard it. They call it increased stormings. And that doesn't necessarily mean more typhoons. They actually measure it by high waves, uh, extreme rainfall, and high wind of any particular measure. Usually it's some threshold. It's not even typhoon, it's like maybe 30 knots. And they look at a model and see if these statistics increase. You get more winds of 30 knots, you get a, a larger wave amount, so you get more intense storms. Anyway. If you just look at the data, here's Providence, Rhode Island, a place where, this is kind of amazing, the, um, oh, well, let me see if I even have it outside of it. Their annual rainfall, I thought it was there, but, oh yeah, their annual rainfall has increased. A lot. From under 40 inches a year to almost 50 inches a year in 100 years, roughly, 1900 to now. It's big. So there are changes. There's always changes. It's, what do you attribute some of these things to? Uh, and then you get to the Rhode Island same station, and you can do the same thing with water, only if you do it here, you run into trouble. Say, Providence, Rhode Island. I was here for that one. I lived there in this rainfall, that six inches, whatever, 24 hours. Um, I remember that day, watching it rain and all the floods in the street flooding and whatnot. But um, there's no trend in this. So there's no, no disclaimer anymore. And they make statements like, they still make this thing. Some okay, people have 7% more rainfall. I don't know more. Anyway. Here, here's the trouble out here. Here's our rainfall. Here's Guam's extreme rainfall. Well, what's going on here? Typhoons. 
Typhoons dominate rainfall by orders, not an order of magnitude almost, but we, get, we can have the, the record of a typhoon in Guam, Okinawa, the Pacific record is 41 inches of rain in 24 hours in a typhoon, slow moving typhoon going over Okinawa. And uh, Guam's record is about 30. It's not, this is the Anderson Air Force Base record. It doesn't have some of them, or it's incomplete. But uh, the peak rainfall in Pamela was, was, over, was 31 inches at the observatory in, uh, at Nick Tams up there. So you can get a lot of rain in a typhoon. Now, our, the people that are supplying our grants, they want us to come out here to the islands and tell us, tell them what's going to happen. What's their rainfall going to be? What are their extremes going to be? What are the storm drain? How, what are they planning for civic planning for storms, for drainage, for peak rainfall? Say, so, well, when you got typhoons, it doesn't matter. Typhoon can give you anything. And if we're going to get fewer of them, then we're, if we get, this is the other point about we need to adapt and, and become resilient. That's the word I keep saying. Resilient communities to climate change. Um, a toolkit for preparing and doing this, this, and I said, well, if we survive these, and we know how to do it, we can survive any of these. Um, so I don't, I mean, and with fewer typhoons, um, it's kind of a mix, and, and, the and even if typhoons get more rain, here's the predict, they say typhoons will have anywhere from 5 to 10% more rain. The, intra, the global model, it's, it's kind of the, the really interesting stuff. And the reasons why, um, it's just some of this stuff, the reasons are just becoming clear, like why, why should there be more rain? Why would there be more rain in a thunderstorm or a typhoon in a warm world? Anybody have any idea why would it rain more? Even one guy after, after Katrina, Famous climate scientist, Kevin Trenberth, since he said it on air, I can use his name. He said, Katrina had 7% more rainfall than it otherwise would have had because of global warming. Where the heck is he getting that number? Katrina had 7% more rainfall. Well, in a warmer world, there's more water vapor in the air. And if you take the column water, if you just keep the same relative humidity, and raise the temperature, even only one degree, and the humidity is the same, you'll end up with 7% more precipitable water. You actually have that much more water. It's because uh, the vapor pressure of water is on this sort of exponential upward curve. It's boiling. It's at you know, it's atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees Celsius. At our temperature, about 33 millibars and the 30 millibars of partial pressure saturation of water. So as you raise the temperature, that keeps going up. And that's where they get those deaths. I said, where would you come up with it? And my brother will ask me, I said, where did they come up with this stuff? You mean that thunderstorm, that cloud right there has 7% more water than it did 27 years ago? <laughs> Yes and no. I said, I know, no, I know what they're saying and why. It's potential. Um, and in a warmer world, it's one of the reasons, kind of why the wet area, and, and the big picture, and I'm probably running out of time, so I'm probably going the, the general, the wet areas get wetter, where it's already rainy and wet, it gets wetter, where it's already dry, like Arizona and places, it gets drier. It's kind of a general rule. And one of the reasons is that precipitation becomes more concentrated. In the models, and this thing it will be in reality, but you get more rain in individual, where it is raining, the clouds have more water to work with, they have heavier rain, and therefore it's more subsidized outside. So the people outside get drier, but the people that are getting the rain get a little more. So, anyway, but we're trying to be projecting this out 100 years, and precipitation, temperature, um, all of these things to do with climate. I think, well, uh, when you have a place like this where you get typhoons, that um, what can you say? Uh, the typhoon, if it moves one mile per hour slower, you get 10% more rainfall. Just make it move slower, you get more rainfall than just by changing the temperature from global warming. And I'm saying it's not going to change it. I mean, but this is all in, in the realm of physics and modeling. What clouds and typhoons and rainfall are supposed to do. And, um, but they've actually taken it the next step. They're, they're trying to downscale it and have us, the climate guys, go out and tell everybody what the weather's going to be. How to prepare for it. Sea level rise might be an obvious thing. That's more gradual and general and, and has a physical mechanism that's easy to understand and see where it could possibly come from. But getting more rain, getting more typhoons, getting more intense typhoons, a typhoon gets 4% more intense for every degree, warmer of the atmosphere. There's all of these numbers being thrown around that are just getting out there as, okay, now we need to plan for this. I'm like, okay, I don't know how you do it, but um, you first got to look at the data. Oh, yeah, I love this. Here's something, too. Temperature. 
This is the actual temperature record for Anderson Air Force Base. And let's see, if we put a linear curve on it, we'll have to see something funny about that. Who's heard, at least, that global warming stopped? It hasn't warmed in the last 15 years. Anyone hear that? It's been an argument. The warming, it's not warming enough now. It's been steady. It got warmer, then flattened out, right? Heard that even the last ICC or the last meeting, they, they had to discuss this because here it actually manifests. We're, we got cooler in the land. Ever since 98, after the big El Nino, here we cooled off. We've been cooling off out here. Um, that's just local. But here's Guam versus Providence, even the Providence, Rhode Island. It has the same sort of. Here's everybody. All the islands and the, and the Northern Hemisphere. We're all doing the same thing. Here's the problem with the Northern Hemisphere. Here's a Hadley Climate Research Unit. It goes up, and then see the leveling off? This is what has the people. And this is where the politics come in. This is, everybody fights. It's time up. Yes, Gary? Five minutes or time? <laughs> Here's the fight. People are fighting over this stuff. People say, no, but the global warming stopped. It hasn't warmed in 15 or 20 years. Well, there it is. Yes. You're right. My brother had a great question. My brother doesn't like any of this stuff because it just means more money out of his pocket to the private sector. He's a commercial fisherman. Every t everything that the government comes up with just generally costs him more money, so he doesn't. He thinks at this. You gotta keep. I said, Mark, how come every time some month goes by, I keep hearing it was the fifth warmest September, the fourth warmest April, the third warmest July? How can it just be keeping this the warmest and, and global warming stopped? They go, oh. Anyone see, anyone see the answer to this? My brother keeps saying, how come if, if the globe hasn't warmed in 15 years, every month goes by, Noah keeps saying it's the fourth warmest July, the third warmest April, the fifth warmest October. So, oh, Todd, that's easy. We're at the top. We're now at the top. So any month that bumps up, all of these months are in the top 10%. Top. Every month in that 10 years is in the top at least 10 or 12. So they can say that about all the months now. So every month that comes along is the top five. It's the eighth warmest October, the ninth warmest September. They're all there because they're sitting at the top. He goes, oh, okay, well, that, that makes sense. He couldn't make sense of it. He said, okay. doesn't make sense. But it all makes sense if you look at the data. And it's easy. Well, here's the northern hemisphere. Here's the island. Here's Micronesia. But see, we're part of the We're part of the northern hemisphere, but we actually cooled off. Where is it going? This is where I defer. I, somebody said, by deferring, I'm, I'm, I'm a denialist. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just like at the typhoon meeting. We all started arguing about global warming. And finally, John McBride, an Australian guy, got up and he said, stop it. We're not arguing about global warming. We're the, we're the typhoon guys. We, we'll just accept their projections of temperature and say, OK, what will happen? We, sh we should know we're the typhoon guys. We'll do typhoons. So I kind of stopped there. but I. I sure know the data. I know every state. I've collected I got hundreds of stations from Alaska. There's the West Coast, the East Coast, to, to everywhere. Oh, even uh, some of the South Indian Ocean Islands. Uh, what's that one down there? Macker Island and, and Carolina. Everywhere. You look at the temperature record, and some of them are crazy. And just to check out what's all going on. There. The tree sip and the rainfall. Ah, oh, I don't know. I see what's going on. Rainfall, anyway. Gary said I had only five. Here's Guam. <coughs> Here's another thing I like to do is take an average. The five years. Here's the driest five-year period looking backwards. There, looking backwards into the late 50s. And you see the average five-year, this is five-year sum of rainfall. By the year 2000, whatever that is, six or seven, the previous five years had uh, over 600 inches of rain, over 100 inches a year for five years. It's almost doubled from 300 to over 600. You can get twice as much rain in any given five-year period is from the wettest to the driest. And I looked at something like that too. I said, what is global warming supposed to do to this? We got, we're dealing now with rainfall that for five years can be an average only, what, 300, whatever, divide 320 by five, they get, what, 50, 60, 70 inches of rain a year versus over 100 for five years. I said, well, the natural variability is huge out here. And we're being asked to provide scenarios for the future. And I'm like, oh, yes. Um, and how do you adapt? How do you, how do you become resilient to the future? I said, well, are we resilient to this? And the typhoons and so forth. I said, we're resilient to that. The only thing, and anyway, I could go on and on, and obviously there's a lot of politics. 
And um, but today, oh, this is another one. What do I got? Oh, here's some of the global.